Welcome to IUPUI's Center for Earth and Environmental Science. I'm your host, Tori Raven, and this is Discovering the Science of the Environment. Today's science adventure is all about fossils. So what exactly are fossils? Well, fossils are the preserved remains, impressions, or traces of organisms that lived in the past. A fossil might be an entire organism, like this trilobite, or maybe just a part of an organism, some bones, a skull, maybe just some teeth, or a shell. But evidence that an organism was present can be fossilized as well. Footprints, for instance. Or yes, even poop. So how old do these remains or traces need to be in order to be considered a fossil? Well, not as old as you might think, only 10,000 years. Does this surprise you? I'm not surprised that you're surprised. When we think about fossils, we normally think about things that are really, really old, geologically old, millions of years old. But the mammoth that fell into a sinkhole in South Dakota 20,000 years ago those remains are just as much fossils as those of a T-Rex that was wandering the same region 66 million years prior to that. This 10,000 year cutoff starts here at the beginning of the Holocene. The Holocene marks the start of our current interglacial period and the end of the last glacial advance from the Ice Age. So organism remains that are Holocene age or younger not a fossil, but older than the Holocene, those are good fossils. Now, for the rest of this talk, we're going to focus on much, much older fossils, ones that are so old that the actual organic structure has been transformed in some manner into stone. And I'm going to talk you through the process about how that happens. But before we get to that point, there's a few things we need to clear up about fossils first. Throughout the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus on animals, but just keep in mind that any of these processes that happen for animals, they will also happen for plants and fungi and other organisms. But just to keep it simple, I'll talk about animals. Now, fossilization is a rare occurrence. In the normal course of events, when an animal dies, either it's been killed by a predator or it was victim of an accident or illness and it's now dead, its body gets consumed. Either it's eaten by the predator that killed it, or it's consumed by scavengers that have come, come across it. Um, any remains that are left over get attacked by decomposer bacteria or fungi. And before too terribly long, there are no remains left. There is nothing to fossilize. And that's typically what happens. So the question becomes, how do we stop this process of decomposition from happening? And the way we do that is we get rid of oxygen. Now, science is full of fun terms, and I've got a couple of them for you right here. Uh, anoxia and hypoxia. So when we have an environment that has no oxygen in it, we refer to it as anoxic. If the environment is low oxygen, we refer to it as being hypoxic. So in order for our organisms to fossilize, we need to get them into an environment that is either anoxic or hypoxic. And how do we do that? So let's think about this. Think, 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 ponder, 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 ponder. Are you pondering what I'm pondering? If you're thinking bury the body, you're on the right track. If the animal's body gets buried after death, there's a possibility that that decomposition process can be slowed down or halted. But not just any soil is gonna do because the soils that you would typically find in a forest or in a meadow, they're very porous and they contain a lot of oxygen. So if you bury an animal's body in a forest, for instance, yes, decomposition will be slowed down, but it's not gonna stop. Not on a time scale relevant to allow fossilization to take place. So we need some special kinds of soils. We need soils that are hypoxic or anoxic, or we need sediment. Now, another fun scientific term, sediment. 
This is one you should be familiar with. You've been studying geology. You know about the different types of rocks, so you are very familiar with sedimentary rock and how it forms. But just as a reminder, sediment itself is this muck that we find here at the bottom of lakes and ponds and slow-moving rivers, at continental edges, um, in, in deltas, which is an area where a river empties into the ocean. These things called sediments build up. And sediments are tiny bits of dirt and debris and organic matter that settle out of the water and accumulate on the bottom. Sediments are similar to soils, but they're sufficiently different that we give them their own name. And sediments, being as they occur in bodies of water, are waterlogged. And because they're waterlogged, they develop these anoxic or hypoxic conditions that would promote fossilization. And another interesting thing about sediments is that they tend to accumulate seasonally. And so you get this lovely layering pattern that develops. And those layers of sediment can actually still be evident when the sediments are transformed into rock. So it's really, really actually quite useful for helping to determine the age of things is counting sediment layers. But the bottoms of lakes and, and ponds and shallow seas are not the only places where you have these anoxic conditions developing. In swamps and marshes, you can also have these low oxygen conditions developing. So these are other places where fossilization might take place. Um, and of course, just the, the bottoms of lakes are a wonderful, wonderful spot for fossilization to eventually occur. So let's talk now about how fossils form. And the first method that I want to describe to you is the one that results in cast and impression fossils. So our animal has been buried in sediments. And in this case, the body eventually does decompose, but it takes such a long time that the surrounding sedimentary matrix has hardened. And so what's left is a hollow in the interior, which then later fills with more sediment. Lots and lots of time passes, millions of years passed, and both the sediment filled hollow and the surrounding sedimentary matrix are transformed to stone. And when we break apart that stone, what we find is this. We have a cast and we have a conjoined impression of that fossil. So typically these two things go together. Where, you, where that hollow has formed, that's the mold, the impression that gets filled with sediment, which creates the cast. So again, these two things go together. So here we have a, a trilobite and a snail just to give you some more examples. So here we have the casts of these animals and here are impressions in the same rock, but not of the exact same animals. Sometimes all you find is the impression. In really excellent cases, what you'll have is a cast and an impression that fit together in a way that the rock was able to be split so that it folds apart like the pages of a book, and you'll have a cast on one side and an impression fossil on the other side. Now, traces of organisms can also form impression fossils. So here we had an area where a dinosaur walked across a muddy area and that mud hardened and was preserved long enough for the mud to become stone. And so those fossil footprints remained. Now, if more sediments had come along and filled those areas, you could get cast fossils of footprints, like what you're seeing here. It basically looks like a reverse image. Another way that fossils form is through compression. And in the case of a compression fossil, you don't have decomposition taking place. You have the actual organic remains still there, but they're highly, highly transformed. So we've We've had an organism that is in these layers and you have successive layers of sediments piling up and piling up. The intense heat and pressure causes the organic remains to transform into what we call a carbon film. And that carbon film leaves an impression on the sedimentary rock. Compression fossils 
are much more common when the organism itself is very thin to begin with. So leaves and fish are two common types of organisms where you'll get compression fossils. Another fun word here, this is permineralization. This is a very, very interesting form of fossilization. So it turns out that a lot of organisms with hard structures, plants, for instance, you're looking at a piece of petrified wood right here, bone, teeth, a lot of these hard structures actually are filled with tiny little holes. And sometimes hard structures actually have quite large holes in them. But these holes can become saturated with water. And if that water is carrying dissolved minerals, which groundwater typically is, then when the water evaporates off, the minerals are left behind. And so you can get these mineral deposits building up in these interior hollow spaces. This is very similar to the process by which stalactites and stalagmites form in caverns where water drips into the cavern, evaporates off and leaves accumulations of mineral behind it over thousands and thousands of years develop into these mineral structures that we call stalactites and stalagmites. Now, the example that I'm showing you here is of a snail where we had a large hollow internal space get filled with mineral rich water, which then developed into calcite crystals. So this is very, very unusual to have a snail that is a calcite crystal snail on the inside. Here at the lower right, you can see the outside portion of the fossil, which underwent a different type of fossilization process, one called replacement, which I'll describe in just a little bit. So it looks quite a bit different. Wood is very, very prone to permineralization. It turns out that trees actually have quite a lot of hollow space in them. Um, most of a tree is actually dead and hollow. I know it looks very, very solid there, um, but only this outermost portion is alive. This large internal section is dead wood, and that dead wood is composed of cells that are referred to as xylem. This is the water transporting structures of the tree. And since only the, the outermost section of the tree is still alive and active, in the interior, what you have are dead xylem cells. And these, they're basically long, narrow tubes that are tightly compacted together. And so those tubes will fill up with water and minerals will settle out and you will get these fantastic fossils where the internal structures are so precisely preserved, you can still even count the tree rings. Um, the annual growth rings of this tree. Now, per, mineral, per mineralization, say that five times really fast, generally happens in conjunction with another process called replacement. And replacement fossils, the, the process is basically the same as per mineralization, except instead of a hollow space being filled with mineral rich water and having mineral deposits settle out, in replacement, it is the actual organic structure of the organism itself that is slowly replaced with minerals. It's sort of a molecule by molecule replacement process. So in this ammonite that you're looking at here, the hollow internal chambers of the animal shell have been subjected to permineralization, but the actual divisions between those chambers, the shell itself, has undergone replacement. So again, the, the two processes often times happen together. So in the case of a tree in petrified wood, not only are those hollow xylem cells filling up and permineralizing with, with minerals, but the actual organic structure of the lignin itself is undergoing a replacement process. So again, that's part of how you get these phenomenally detailed fossils. The final process I want to talk to you about is one which results in intact fossils. And there are a few ways that this can happen. Um, very often, the fossils that are described as being intact, these are ones where the actual organic remains are still present. Typically, this is where we see this with bone. We're dealing with very, very young fossils. 
ones that haven't been buried long enough for replacement or for mineralization to have taken place. But it can also happen with older material as well. And one of the most common places to see this is with pollen. Now, pollen is an incredibly common substance. It is part of the reproductive structures of plants. So every flowering plant produces pollen. And a lot of that pollen is very lightweight and it gets airborne and drifts around and it can settle out over bodies of water, sink down to the bottom and become incorporated into the sediments. It turns out that pollen is composed of a really, really, really tough material. And that material is called sporopollenin. And scientists describe it as being chemically inert, which basically means it does not decompose pretty much ever. So pollen that has been at the bottom of a lake for 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, 50,000 years is just as fresh looking as pollen produced this year. And this is a really nice characteristic that scientists can make use of. You can take sediment cores, extract sediment cores from a lake and look through those sediments. And by identifying the pollen that is preserved in those sediment cores, you can determine what kinds of plants grew in the vicinity of that lake at various points in the past. You can still actually even find pollen in sedimentary rock. It's difficult to find because pollen is tiny, it's microscopic, but it's there and you can find it. And so it is a useful, very useful tool for scientists. Another type of intact fossil that we find is amber. And amber is fossilized tree resin. Now, not every species of tree produces resin. Only specific types do, like pine trees. And when a tree is wounded, it will produce tremendous amounts of resin as a defensive response. It's trying to seal up that wound. And resin is incredibly, incredibly sticky. And things will get caught in it. And as more resin is produced, anything that has become stuck in the resin can end up getting entombed within this massive amount of resin. Over time, the characteristics of the resin change. The molecules undergo a process that's called cross-linking. And what this does is it makes the resin change. It becomes less sticky and it hardens. And if that hardened resin then gets into an anoxic environment, it gets buried in sediments, that cross-linking process can continue to happen. And if it continues to happen over millions of years, what you end up with is this hard fossilized substance called amber. Now, things that get stuck in the amber, those are called inclusions. And you see quite a few inclusions here in this photograph that was taken under a microscope. Most often inclusions are just little bits of debris, dust, moss, twigs, things that just got blown in and stuck in, in the resin. But sometimes animals are trapped in the resin. And typically this is gonna be very small animals like insects or spiders. What you're seeing in this one are spider webs. So there's some spider web here and there's more spider web over here. Um, it's generally small organisms, but sometimes you get bigger things getting trapped. Um, there are cases where entire flowers have been fossilized in amber or bird feathers, or even occasionally small lizards have been entombed in amber. So what are some of the things that we can learn by studying fossils? Well, first off, let's just acknowledge the fact that fossils are the history of life on Earth, quite literally written in stone. But we need to keep in mind that that is a very selective history that we're reading. Not all organisms are equally likely to become fossilized. So the fossils that we see are only a subset of all the plants and animals and fungi and 
other life that has ever inhabited the planet. So I want to walk you through the six things that increase the likelihood of fossilization of an organism. So number one, location, location, location. Being in the right place is key. So in order to get buried in sediments, an organism had to live someplace where there were sediments. So marine or other aquatic organisms are much more likely to fossilize than organisms that lived on land. For animals that lived on land and plants that occurred on land, if they were in a swamp or a marsh or a type of location like that where the soils were very anoxic, chances were better for eventually becoming a fossil. So critters that lived up on mountains or out on the plains, not so much chance of becoming a fossil. Secondly, being in the wrong place at the wrong time is actually kind of important. Um, remember, most animals, when they die, they get consumed by other organisms. So basically being someplace when catastrophe strikes or an accident happens that results in the animal's death and its body being buried in sediments, those types of catastrophic happenings or accidents are going to be more likely to lead to fossilization. So being in the wrong place at the wrong time or from our perspective, maybe the right place at the right time so that we eventually get to see the fossil. So resistance to decomposition, incredibly important here. And so hard structures like bone and tooth and shell and wood and pollen, organisms that have these types of structures are going to be more likely to form fossils. So you cannot underestimate the importance of an organism having some type of hard structure. Things without hard parts just don't fossilize well. So those types of organisms may have been very common, but we would just never know because they don't fossilize. Geologically, long-lived species are much more likely to show up in the fossil record simply because it's a matter of time. A group like ammonites or trilobites that were around for 300 million or so years, that's a long time at least some individuals within those groups are likely to have encountered the conditions that would lead to fossilization. Similarly, geographically abundant species are more likely to show up in the fossil record, simply because if you have millions of individuals of a particular species, there's a fairly good chance that at least a few of them are going to encounter conditions that will lead to fossilization. Rare species, ones that only have just a, a few thousands of individuals, chances are less good that any of those individuals will encounter the proper conditions. We're more likely to find fossils in younger rocks. And there's a couple of reasons for this. First off, we're dealing with sedimentary rock. And given enough time, and more and more sediments piling up on top of that rock, the intense heat and pressure that gets generated may cause that sedimentary rock to transform into metamorphic rock. And any fossils that are contained may be destroyed in that process. Also, really, really old rock gets subducted back into the mantle. And so it's physically destroyed. So while we have more of this younger rock, rock that's 50 million years old, 100 million years old, 200 million years old. Yes, we have lots of that kind of rock, lots of fossils from those time periods. We have very, very little of the much older rock, the 500 million year old plus rock. Not so much of that left. And so there's less rock to be finding fossils in. So it's just a matter of availability. Now, what can we learn from fossils? Well, actually, quite a lot. We can learn quite a lot from fossils. They allow us to discover what this ancient life was that actually existed on this planet tens and hundreds of millions of years ago. So we're discovering new species all the time. 
the types of organisms that we're finding tell us something about what the environment was like. We can actually determine things about individual animals as well. What you're looking at here is a single vertebrae of a Diplodocus, a large brontosaurid type of dinosaur. And this individual suffered a traumatic injury to its tail at some point in its life. And it survived the injury at least long enough for the broken bones in the tail to heal. And they actually fuse together. So that's what you're seeing here on the right are three vertebrae that fuse together to form one vertebrae. And so we see the evidence of this injury that the animal suffered. We can see evidence of how animals lived and how they died together. So sometimes you'll find areas where you have massive numbers of, of animals, all of the same type together. And we refer to these as mass death sites or mass burials. And here you're looking at, at some trilobites. And in order for all these animals to have died together at the same time like this, um, something must have been occurring that would first off maybe bring them together. And then something traumatic or catastrophic must have happened to bury them all while they were together. So the thought here is probably that these trilobites may have come together to, to breed. And then some kind of storm potentially came in and the trilobites ended up getting smothered in a, a load of sediment. So we have this mass burial site. And sometimes fossils provide us with evidence of extraordinary ecological dramas and interactions, very intense interactions between animals can be preserved in time. And so what you're seeing here is a large predatory fish, a small pterodactyl, and then there is a third fish that is just a little tiny fish, too really small to see. Let's get a closer look at this. What happened here was that this small pterodactyl must have been skimming over the surface of the water where it captured a small fish that was swimming near the surface. You cannot see it in this photograph, but there is actually a little fish still in the mouth and gullet of that pterodactyl. While still skimming over the water, this larger predatory fish must have leapt out and grab the pterodactyl by the wing. We can see its wing in the fish's mouth. The pterodactyl was too large for this fish to swallow, and the fish must have begun thrashing around trying to get the pterodactyl out of its mouth. But the wing was caught in the teeth of the fish. This particular type of fish has many, many fine, sharp little teeth. And the pterodactyl's wing was caught, and the fish was not able to dislodge this prey item that it had attempted to take, but which was too big. The fish thrashing around, trying to rid itself of the pterodactyl, pulled the pterodactyl underwater, the pterodactyl drowned, and the fish itself eventually succumbed to its injuries from this and died and settled down in the bottom. And their bodies were collectively buried in sediment, probably sediment that had been thrown up from the bottom as the fish was lying down there struggling, trying to rid itself of the pterodactyl. And so the fish and the pterodactyl and the other little fish were all entombed together in these sediments, buried, kept away from decomposition processes, and then more sediments settled in and eventually it all was preserved in stone. And that right there, is a very good place to end this because I really can't top this particular little ecological drama. So I hope you have enjoyed this presentation all about fossils and have learned just a little bit. And so this is Tori Raven bidding you adieu. And remember that today, like any day, is an excellent day to do science. If you want to see a lot of fossils, the place to go do that is at a museum. But there's a few things I want you to keep in mind the next time you're at a museum looking at fossils. The first off is that what you're seeing, particularly for the big skeletons, is a reconstruction. Um, now, sometimes they do actually have actual real fossils out on display, and those are generally marked as being real fossils. 
But a lot of what you see are reproductions. And there are reasons for this. And so I want to kind of explain to you how this is done and why it's done. So when fossils are discovered out in the field and they're collected, typically only parts of an individual organism are found. Very, very rarely are entire skeletons found. Generally, it's just a few pieces. And these original pieces are generally speaking far too valuable to be put on dis out on display, or actually they're quite delicate and displaying them could cause them to kind of fall apart. So the original fossils are very often kept carefully preserved back in a museum's collection area. And so replicas of the fossils are put out on display for the public to enjoy. Now, there's a lot of art that goes into the science of making these specimens. Um, so to create these skeletons that are out on display, what scientists do is they make molds of the actual fossils and then cast a replica, um, typically in resin, of that original fossil. But because they're dealing with partial skeletons, they'll have to use many, many different individual dinosaurs, for instance, um, portions of each of them to try to put it all together to create an entire skeleton. And the individual dinosaurs that they may have to work from could be different ages and different sizes. And so their bones don't all fit quite nicely together. So you have specialized scientists, artists who sculpt these bones. They, they do all sorts of stuff with taking measurements and scaling them and, and they actually sculpt out replica bones that will all fit nicely together to create these skeletons that you see. Um, now, another reason for having replicas on display as opposed to the original fossils is that the originals are stone and that weighs a tremendous, tremendous amount. And when you're dealing with animals that are enormous themselves, you're talking about a lot of weight. Even with the replicas themselves, you need these massive metal frameworks to support these reconstructions. And if you're utilizing the actual fossil bone within these constructs, you need even more heavy duty support. Now, one of the nice things about using replica fossils is that it allows scientists to arrange them in ways that they wouldn't dare do if they were dealing with the original fossils themselves. So here we can take a replica and we can set it up in a way that it's showing us action, it's showing us drama. Here we have an Allosaurus preying on, we have a predation event taking place here, predation event in aisle three. We have this Allosaurus, it is, it's knocked over this Stegosaurus and it's going to, to eventually consume it, we presume. And the display can be put up in a way that allows people to walk around it. Instead of just being enclosed behind glass, only allowing a fixed view, we can get perspective. We can walk around this and see it from different angles so that we can notice different things. Um, and, and scientists just, they really like, you know, setting up these dramatic scenes. So here we have two micro raptors engaged in a tussle, fighting over something or other. Um, you would never, ever, ever take actual real fossils and display them in this way. So the use of replicas is actually quite fun. Another reason for having replicas is because sometimes there's one particular one that everybody wants, that particular dinosaur. So I want you to meet Stan. Stan is one of the more famous T-Rex fossils because it was one of the most complete skeletons ever found. Um, the little diagram down here, you can see all the bones of Stan that they actually found. Not much is missing here, just some vertebrae in the tail, some of the lower leg bones, a few ribs, the arms, not much was missing. 
everybody wanted a replica of Stan because replicas made from Stan, there's not much guesswork involved in what that dinosaur skeleton actually looks like because you have most of the original there to work with. And so when you have these unusual rare fossils, very often replicas get made so that many museums around the world can all display this same rare fossil and people all over the world get to enjoy it. Now, fossils tell us a lot about what ancient life on earth was like. So let's have a look at some of the diversity of that ancient life. So basically we're gonna take a little mini museum trip right now. And we're gonna start out with some of the more ancient organisms. These are corals, which they have a lot of hard parts, very, very nicely and easily fossilized. Brachiopods are another type of fossil that is extremely, extremely common. They look like little clams, but they're a completely different type of animal altogether. Um, now on these, on these slides, I will tell you the, either the exact age of the fossil, if I know it, or I'll give you the general time frame when those types of, of organisms were present. Now, sometimes you'll find slabs that have a lot of fossils in them. And in this case, we've got not only brachiopods, we've got these other little structures. So there's a brachiopod. We've got these other little stacked rings and ring-like structures. These are little pieces of a type of animal called a crinoid. And crinoids are a kind of echinoderm. They're related to um, starfishes, sea stars. And we still actually have crinoids that are alive today. Another name for a crinoid is a sea lily. That's their, their common name. And actually it turns out that Indiana is absolutely famous for its crinoid fossils. So I have another big slab here with lots and lots of crinoids on it. It's an animal, but it does look very, very plant-like. Here's another type of echinoderm, some fossilized sea stars, otherwise known as starfish. And then moving on into the arthropods, we have trilobites, many, many, many different kinds of trilobites. Um, trilobites are arthropods. They are related to crustaceans like lobsters and crabs and shrimps, um, insects, spiders. Um, one of the ways you can see that relationship is with the segmented exoskeleton of the animal. And what you're seeing here at the right is a, a close up of the animal's eye. The trilobite has a compound eye very, very similar to that of an insect's compound eye. Just another different sort of a trilobite. You can get trace fossils from trilobites. Here you see a little trackway of a trilobite as it had walked across the bottom of an ancient ocean. Those sediments got fossilized. That's rather unusual, but sometimes does happen. These are ureterids otherwise known as sea scorpions. That's another type of arthropod, very common in the Silurian. Here we have a younger fossil. This is from the Miocene epoch of the tertiary period. This is a fossilized crab and it looks very, very, very similar to modern day blue crabs. A much older crustacean, a shrimp from the Jurassic. And here's a dragonfly. You do occasionally get insects fossilizing in some place other than amber. Mollusks like uh, clams and snails, very, very frequently fossilized because they've got those nice hard shells. Um, so clams are otherwise known as bivalves because they have two shells that join together and are hinged. And then gastropods uh, is another name for snails. Um, in this particular photo that you're looking at, the type of bivalve is called a scallop, and you're only seeing a, a single valve of the two valves um, up there at the left. And the snails are called turritella snails. Now, another type of mollusk is called a cephalopod, and these include squids and octopods and more ancient relatives such as belemnites and ammonites. Here we have a highly, highly unusual fossil, 
a fossilized squid. Now, unlike snails and clams, which have hard shells on the outside, cephalopods oftentimes have their shell internal. And that is the situation for squid. So this dark material you're seeing in the center is the internal shell of the squid. It's called a pen. But in this particular fossil, you actually have some compression fossilization going on as well. So you're seeing a carbon imprint of the actual soft parts of the squid. So you can see where the eye was. You can see the tentacles. You can see the fin at the end of its body. Um, and interestingly, down here on the right, you have a fossil walrus tusk that was carved to resemble a giant squid. So that's a different kind of fossil altogether. Another example of, an, of a cephalopod is Orthocerus, which was an animal that lived during the Ordovician. And you can see an actual fossil up here at the top and an artist's reconstruction of what the animal might have looked like in life down at the bottom, along with some fossilized ammonites. Now, Orthocerus was a, a long conical type of cephalopod, and the animal actually only lived in a portion of its shell. So when it was little and smaller, it was down at the left end of the shell, and as it grew, grew larger, it made successively larger and larger chambers to live in. So you can see these separate chambers in this fossil. Now, the line through the center is a structure called the siphuncle. And this basically connected all the chambers together and it was a tube through which the animal pumped gases into the chamber to control buoyancy. So the, the animal could make itself more or less buoyant so it could move up and down in the water column. This is a belemnite, another type of cephalopod. This one had an internal shell structure. And then here we have some ammonites. Ammonites were an incredibly diverse group and they persisted for well over 300, as a group, they persisted for well over 300 million years. And so I just wanna show you some of the diversity of different ammonites. They're incredibly, incredibly variable in what they look like. Now, sometimes when the replacement fossilization process is taking place, you actually get gemstone type minerals doing the replacing. And so here we have an ammonite that has been what we call opalized. So this is a fossil that is constructed of the semi-precious gemstone opal. Here we have one where you can actually see the different layers of the animal's shell, which is just absolutely phenomenal. It's a fantastic fossil. And not all ammonites were tightly coiled. Some of them were more loosely coiled. Some of them looked more like corkscrews. Just tremendous variation amongst ammonites. Sometimes you have the mother of pearl layer from the shell of the ammonite persisting. Um, there are a lot of modern day snails and, and clams and such that have a mother of pearl layer as one of the layers in their shell. Now, this mother of pearl, it looks similar to the, the opalized ammonites, but it, it's different. It's, it's completely different. Just a few more different types of ammonites here. These squiggly lines that you're seeing, these are actually the suture lines between chambers. Um, some ammonites had really weirdly shaped chambers and others had nice smooth little ones, just different differences between species. Here you have an ammonite fossil that was cut in half so that you can see those internal chambers and the siphuncle. Um, and in this case, the chambers in the shell have been geodized. So they've, they've formed like a geode does. And there you have the siphuncle. Now, ammonites are a type of fossil that can serve as what is called an index fossil. And I want to explain to you about index fossils. These are ones that are used to identify and define geologic time periods. 
and they share certain characteristics. So index fossils will have a short vertical range, widespread geographic distribution, and show rapid evolutionary trends. What exactly does all that mean? So I'll walk you through it. So first off, a widespread geographic distribution. These are animals that weren't confined to just a little restricted area on the planet. They didn't only occur in, say, Madagascar or only in Australia. They were widespread and found throughout the globe. Um, so found in fossils that are found in many, many, many different places. Showing rapid evolutionary trends. What this means is that although the group as a whole persisted for a very long time span geologically, ammonites were around for over 300 million years as a group. Within that time frame, though, you had rapid evolution of new species at the same time as older species were going extinct. And so you had sort of a series replacement of one species by another. So you didn't have the same species persisting for all 300 million years. You had different sets of ammonite species showing up at specific time frames within those 300 million years. And those different individuals are going to be getting fossilized in different strata of rock. So any particular species is only present during a relatively short period of time, ge geologically speaking. And so they're only found within a certain subset of strata across the entire range of strata that the group as a whole shows up in. And so that's what that short vertical range means, just a short segment of strata where you're actually finding these fossils. And so the index fossil, because it is so widespread and because it occurred at this very discrete time interval, it serves as a means of identifying that particular type of strata. And it provides a means of estimating the age of particular strata because those certain fossils are there. So if we find a particular species in certain strata in North America, and we find the same species in strata over in Europe, we can make a, a very good estimation that those strata are of the same age because they are containing the same fossils. So that's one mechanism by which index fossils are used. Now, moving away from our arthropods, let's get into some cartilaginous fishes, such as sharks. Now, cartilage does not fossilize well. It, it just doesn't. It is not as hard as bone. It decomposes very readily. So for cartilaginous fishes, we don't really, generally speaking, have bones. But we do have a lot of teeth. We have lots and lots of shark teeth. Teeth are much harder. They fossilize much better. On occasion, you do get the very rare full body fossil of a cartilaginous type of fish. In this case, it's a stingray. So stingrays, skates, sharks, they're all considered cartilaginous fishes. And this is a little bit more of a compression type fossil as opposed to a strict replacement fossil. A lot of times you have more than one process going on during fossilization. So you can get compression happening with replacement and of course, replacement with permineralization, et cetera. Moving on to our bony fishes, um, lots of little bones, fossilized very well. Now on this particular specimen, I wanna draw your attention to all the work that actually went into preparing this fossil specimen for display. You'll notice this white band that outlines the, the body of the animal. This is where the scientists who have prepared the fossil have very carefully carved away the surrounding rock to provide a matrix that shows off the fossil in a better way that allows you to see it more clearly. Um, they've probably even painted this cutout rock white to make it show up extraordinarily well. Um, sometimes the fossil bones themselves might actually be treated with a stain to make them a little darker, make them stand out more. 
So a lot of work goes into preparing these fossils for the public to enjoy. Here we have another fish. Um, this one, you can actually see the scales on its body. Moving on to the reptiles, not dinosaurs, but other types of reptilian types of critters. Dinosaurs are technically not actually reptiles. They're quite different. Here we have a turtle. And birds and feathered dinosaurs. Now, this is a really excellent fossil because you can actually see the impressions of the feathers. So we've got a little bit of a, an impression fossil happening here. We might have had a cast fossil formed as well. And we've also got replacement fossil in here as well. So quite a lot going on. So that concludes our whirlwind tour 